So I'm sending it live. Angita, ma'am, please. Hi, everybody. Good morning to our eminent American guest, Professor Eugene and Gazip, today's principal speaker. And a very good evening from Mumbai, India to all of you. This is Dr. Sangeeta Sharma, Head Department of English, BK Birla College of Art, Science and Commerce an autonomous institution affiliated to the University of Mumbai. I begin this much anticipated session by welcoming our special guest, Professor Eugene Engesim, who graciously agreed to be the keynote speaker for this international and interdisciplinary webinar. Welcome, sir. Now Thank you. I would now I would like to welcome the host principal, a young and dynamic scholar, Dr. Avinash Patil. I also welcome our director, esteemed Dr. Naresh Chandra, a veteran academician, researcher, and a seasoned academic leader. I also welcome all my colleagues and friends and lovers of literature, not only from India, but abroad as well. Now, let us formally start the session. I would like to invite the principal for extending a formal welcome and for acquainting you all with our premier institution. Over to Dr. Avinash Patel, sir. Good evening, all the participants, and good morning to our esteemed speaker, Dr. Eugene Gezer, respected Dr. Naresh Chandra, Director, BK Birla College Kalyan, our esteemed speaker, Dr. Eugene Gezer, full professor from Department of English from Clayton State University, USA, Vice Principals, Mrs. Smita Gupta, and other vice principals, Dr. Sangeeta Sharma, head department of English and other faculty members, that is Dr. Grishma Khobragade and the faculty members from our college and other institutions and dear students. In this current situation, pandemic situation of COVID-19, when we have to stay home to stay safe, Having a webinar on digital platform like this with an international speaker like Dr. Eugene Gezem is really appreciable. We appreciate this effort from Department of English to have this webinar titled Gender and Race Burden in African American Literature. And we are very fortunate to have an international speaker with us for our today's webinar like Dr. Eugene Gezem, a professor from Department of English of Clayton State University, USA. We have a special place in our mind and heart for Dr. Eugene Gezem and Clayton State University. Our first faculty exchange program started with Clayton State University and in the year 2010-11, Dr. Eugene visited our college and was with us for a long time. And similarly, when myself as well as many faculty members from our college visited Clayton State University, he was always there for us to take special care. He is a very kind and caring person I have seen. We extend a warm welcome to Dr. Eugene Gesem on behalf of our college and management. We also have with us our director, Dr. Naresh Chandra sir from BK Birla College Kalya, who is a constant source of inspiration for all of us. We welcome him for our today's webinar. We also welcome all the faculty members and students participating from all over the country for this particular webinar. 
As many participants have registered for this webinar across the country, we will like to take this opportunity to give a brief profile of our college. <clears throat> BK Birla College of Art, Science and Commerce Kalyan is a multi-faculty premier institution of higher learning with autonomous status. Having an enrollment of more than 7,000 students for UG, PG and research programs, and is affiliated to the University of Mumbai. In addition, we have more than 4,000 students in junior college section. The college was established in 1972 by Kalyan Citizens Education Society with the blessings of late Sri BK Birlaji and late Srimati Sarlaji Birla. The college is spread over 20 acres of land, including BK Birla Public School in the prime location of Kalyan City and developed as an eco-friendly campus. The college offers 22 undergraduate and 27 postgraduate courses in arts, science and commerce and nine PhD programs. The college has been re-accredited by NAC for the third cycle with A grade having a CGPA of 3.58 to, to the scale of four. The college has been awarded the best college award by the University of Mumbai. The college has been certified with the ISO 9001-2015. The college has been granted the College of Excellence status by University Grants Commission New Delhi from 2015. The college has been granted the autonomous status by University Grants Commission and University of Mumbai from 2018-19. The RUSA, that is Rashtriya Uchchatar Shiksha Abhiyan, has sanctioned our college a grant of rupees 5 crore under the component 8 for enhancing quality and excellence in select autonomous colleges. And recently, the college has been approved as a potential mentor institution to provide help, support, and guidance to enable the mentee institutions, which are non-accredited, to upgrade their academic performance and get accredited by NAC under the UGC Paramarski. With this, once again, we extend a warm welcome to one and all for this national seminar. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now we move on to the next speaker, our director, Dr. Naresh Chandra. I request, sir, to please guide us and bless us on this occasion. Sir, please. Professor Eugene, Principal Dr. Avinash Patil, all my esteemed colleagues, invited guests, fellow participants, and my dear student friends. We are indeed very happy to have Professor Eugene for today's session as our special guest. He has been known to us for more than a decade. We have an excellent academic relationship with him and with Clayton State University. As Professor Patil mentioned, we had signed an MOU under which we had we continue to have faculty exchange program and we wish to have a student exchange faculty exchange research collaboration in times to come i am also very happy that dr sangeeta sharma and her team has taken this initiative to organize an international webinar wherein we listen to our eminent academician in the field of English literature. Hearty welcome to you, sir. And I would like to tell to my colleagues here and the part fellow participant, as we know, is a difficult time, several difficult situations, crisis situation, but then we have to understand, we have to live with it. 
we have to prepare taking all the precautionary and preventive measures we have to help ourselves we help we have to help our friends neighbors parents everyone around us it is very rightly said today the best solution is is to save taking all precautionary measures we have to sensitize all our fellow colleagues we have to ensure that all the procedures sops are strictly as provided by government and competent authorities is strictly followed and adhered to on the academic subject i would not like to speak because we will listen to our guest but i take the opportunity to request our esteemed guests that we at bk birla college wish to have more academic collaborative activities with csu we would like to have more webinars would like to have if possible joint research activity and continue in whatever way possible our academic relationship with this note my dear student friends please enrich yourself i am sure it will be a wonderful session we need not worry about exam will be there or will not be there learning is a beautiful thing we should focus on we must utilize this time in learning as much as possible and also try try to provide developing some such system wherein partly online and partly offline theory and practical project assignment etc they have been they can be undertaken by every one of us and is a collective responsibility is not only for our country but for the whole world i wish and pray the very best for each one of us around the globe in this pandemic situation we had to overcome our best wishes once again hearty welcome to professor yujin thank you thank you very much for accepting our invitation thanks sir for your words of wisdom before i introduce the guest of the day may i request you to please post questions in the chat box as professor engism's address is nearing its end the relevant ones would be taken up for discussion now let me present and introduce speaker professor eugene engism to you professor eugene engism is a full professor of english clayton state university georgia usa his areas of primary expertise are 20th century british literature modern drama contemporary british literature world literature post colonial literature english literature survey courses and composition he has dozens of research papers published in peer reviewed journals and more than 20 research presentations have been selected at juried national and international conferences i present here some of the highlights of his rich academic career professor engism has received several honors and awards from prestigious academic bodies distinguished faculty award award for teaching excellence and mentoring 
award for encouraging and supporting students, award for duty consciousness and leadership skills are just a few to name. He has been the CSU Senator since 2017 till date. He was the chair of College Arts and Sciences Teacher of the Year Committee till 2013. He is the chair and founder of the Department of English newsletter, The Vibrant Wise. Since 2009 till date, he is the advisor on the Committee of International Program. He is on the Awards Committee, Department of English CSU. Apart from this, he holds key positions in several community leadership bodies. As far as knowledge of languages is concerned, in addition to English, he is well versed with French too. Ladies and gentlemen, I now invite Professor Eugene Engesim to address you. Over to Professor Engesim. All right, are you getting me? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Thank OK, thank you so much. Uh, uh, let me start with uh, these few words. Uh, Dr. Chandra slash director. Principal Dr. Avinash. Chair Lady Dr. Sanjita. My esteemed and dear colleagues, fellow students, ladies and gentlemen. It is my singular pleasure to talk to you today on a title that is quite broad and also interdisciplinary. It is not going to be a presentation that is contingent upon just an in-depth analysis of a defined text, but it will be a broad view of literature in light of society. And this is very useful because I'm aware that not all our participants are majoring in English literature, British literature, or literature at all. So my goal here is to open some windows, windows that will enable even those not majoring in literature to also see value in literature and to see how literature can be a, a, a tool for social change. That said, I will proceed and my discussion or lecture, whatever name we want to give to it, would touch on history, slavery, and various movements. I will culminate in selected works and also touch on the current as we speak, what is happening in the US as part of the raw material through which writers have written over the years. Again, my title is Gender and Race Burden in African American Literature. And let me, oh, having some difficulties going to the next slide. OK, good. I'm fine now. Thank you. So first of all, what's literature? Literature, literature is a word of art expressed carefully through language. It is the product of imagination and creation. It means you imagine and you create literature. That's what literature is. But it serves as a mirror image to society. Therefore, literature is not just for entertainment. It reflects society. And that makes it lit makes literature relevant to all participants, whether a scientist, a medical doctor. I'm aware that I'm managing the, the directors here who are not doing anything in the field of literature. I'm also aware that the biologists, etc. So literature can be enjoyed and can be useful to everybody. So the rule and function of literature, as I mentioned earlier, literature, of course, render itself as a tool for social change because it draws attention to the social and the political situations of our society. Whether you're talking about America, whether you're talking about Africa, you're talking about India. Literature can be a tool for social change. Because again, it deals with contemporary matters and even past situations. And African-American literature in particular 
focuses on themes of unique interest to black people, distinguishing the, their own space and values in the larger American community. Such themes include slavery, freedom, racism, inequality, or even equality, culture, and religion. These are the preoccupying areas in African American literature. But let me take you a bit into history, a long journey into slavery in the USA. You are aware that many Africans, many of the millions of them, were forced, kidnapped, and sold to the West. And America was one of the purchasers of those slaves. Purchaser in quotation, called on by people. But for centuries, they were forced to work under very painful situations in, tobacco, in the fields of tobacco, cotton, etc. And over the period of the Atlantic trade, approximately 1526 to 1867, 2.5 million slaves had been shipped from Africa and 10.7 million had arrived in the Americas and forced into backbreaking labor. By 1820, nearly four Africans, for every one European had crossed the Atlantic. About four out of every five females that traversed the Atlantic were Africa. So men and women were victims of this situation. And of course, over that period, so many had been shipped to Af from Africa to, the, to Europe and many arrived in the US. A majority came actually from Europe to the US. And more than 90% of enslaved Africans were imported into the Caribbean and South America. Only about 6% of African captives were sent directly to British North America. Yet, by 18 25 by the 19th century, the US had a quarter of blacks in the New World. The US ended up having a big chunk. And by 1820, nearly four Africans for every one European had crossed, as I mentioned. And of course, by mid 19th century, the abolition movement had started. And this culminated to blood to bloody American Civil War and the victory of the Union soldiers to set free, in quotation marks, about 4 million slaves. But we must remember, freedom of slaves from the tobacco and cotton fees, as well as from domestic chores, did not end the legacy of slavery. It did not stop it. It was going to open a new brutal chapter. And of course, this led to civil rights movements, as some of you, or many of you are aware. And why in, the, in America, especially in the South, and after the slaves have been set free, there was a construction. The construction merely meant fighting to integrate the Southern state that has seceded into the main American culture, which was dominated by the North, and also finding a legal status with respect to the free slaves. Although such was enacted, but the KKK will not allow that to happen. The white supremacists will not allow that to happen. And you may ask me, why am I going this far? It's just to tell you where African-American writers have emanated. What has been the, cut, the, the springboard behind such writing? And one thing before I go to the next slide is this. I'm quite aware of the sensitivities of many cultures around the world. And I would have shown more net breaking pictures, but I can't because of purpose of decency and all that. If we were in an American college or university, I will show if I will show this thing without any qualms. But given our international flavor here, I want to restrict what I show to you. So after slavery, what did the slave masters? The white supremacists, those who believe that their race is more superior than that of others, what did they do? They started what is called destruction. That is, they started through art, through painting, through all forms of things to deconstruct the beauty of black Americans, to deconstruct and to destroy the beauty of women. For example, 
distortion and representation. This is a good example of what was very common. Sarah Birdman was a symbol of inferiority and black female sexuality for the next 100 years, starting from 1810. And it is unfortunate that this beautiful lady who left Cape Town in South Africa in 1810, went to London, became a subject of public display. She was used for entertainment. She was trimmed naked and she was displayed around the country. People will come and see her. And you see the way her futures are extremely exaggerated in such a way that she lacks sexual disability. She lacks the beauty that characterizes every woman. I mean, every woman. Every part of her life is exaggerated so as to make her look less inferior. Not just inferior, but more inferior. Take, see what's happening in this uh, presentation. Whites are examining her body, they are looking at her, they are all in shock. She was the subject of public mockery. But she also remembered that by 1814, she, did, she left Britain. She didn't live on her own volition. She was taken from Britain, from Britain to France. And what happened? She became a subject of scientific and medical research. European scientists conducted research to see the abnormality of black people. She died a year later, and you could not imagine. After she died, what did they do? They cut her sexual organs and her brain and display in the museum for scientists and people to come and see. It was in the museum in Paris until recently at 1985. I mean, her body parts were there. This is a real human being. In his detailed report, of uh, George's Covey asserts that, that he had never seen a human head resemble that of a monkey such as such. Therefore, you see what's happening. So you can see all the description there. So she was an embodiment of cruel slavery and she remains an embodiment of what the blacks have gone through. And of course, writers will not sit by. Writers don't write in a vacuum. Writers base their writing almost always on what happens in society or what has happened in history. Slaves, <coughs> excuse me, slaves participated in auction blocks. Auction blocks, for example, you can see that picture on my on the screen. Uh, excuse me. Let me get some little water to get more energy. <laughs> auction blocks. Slaves were auctioned. Black women construct as objects and showcase as inferior. You can see that. Look at this too. Binary opposition. The court of true womanhood. White women are submissive and morally superior. Black women were seen as inferior and hypersexual. Just see the image. See the contrast <coughs> between these two. Look at the, the, the white lady. She's looking slim. The black woman is big, she looks brutal, and she's in a row of servitude. <clears throat> you can also see these pictures. Look at how ugly she's dressed. Look at the contrast as well. On my right, you can see how bad the image is. But also just suppose that, just con put that in contrast with that of this white lady. See how beautiful, beautiful in quotation marks. Cause big beauty rest in the eyes of the beholder. But you want to, contact, to, to show a big contrast between a white person and a black person. Look at the president, President Obama, and the wife, Michelle Obama. See the way Obama is displayed. Look at that picture. It resembles that of a monkey. But this is where the real beautiful Michelle Obama is. So these are current attempts at objectification, ongoing efforts to dehumanize black women and construct them as primitive and animalistic. Reconstruction of female identity. And of course, reconstruction of female identity 
has been something that many writers have been fighting to reconstruct, including Alice Walker. If you study the tale life of Grace Copeland, you find that man is beautiful and educated. And the purpose of Alice Walker is to project a new mode, a new modern American woman. Not from the anger of slave masters, but the anger of her real beauty. And if you look at Ruth as well, Ruth in that novel, published in 1970, is a symbol of change. She's open to interact with the white society. So blacks are giving that lending hand, that helping hand to their white counterparts. And Ruth, of course, if you look at the word in Hebrew, Ruth stands for beauty, openness, and all that. But also remember that the requirement for joining what was called the, the, the feminine court was made in such a way that only the white will fit into that category. The conditions were those of a true womanhood by which a woman judged herself and was judged by her husband, her neighbors and society. And those could be divided into piety purity, submissiveness, and domesticity. But then, that means slave women were deprived of this womanhood because it meant that a white woman needs to be pure. And for you to, not, for you to be pure, you need not to have lost your virginity. But remember that during slavery, the slave masters have deflowered female black slaves. They already lost their definition of a pure woman. And the same people, who deflower them, would turn around to chastise them for not being pure because they are not virgins. So there was no way out, no exit. And such, according to when you are not pure, it means you are not in consonance with God. It means you lack, you lack moral tenacity, moral vibrancy. So raping black women by slave master was not a big deal, even as it took away their purity thus rendering them impure in the eyes of the rapists themselves. Instead of these four unattainable virtues meant to fit just the whites, what did the, the black women do? They started defining, defining God for themselves, defining motherhood for themselves, embracing the issue of skin consciousness, skin awareness, the ability to address in consonance with their culture, their upbringing, to be who they are. You can go to early slave narratives. They've narrated the pain they went through during slavery. And of course, early slave narrative like the, the autobiography of Miss Jen Pidman, who talks of her journey from the South to the North and all the pain she went through. About 6,000 such narratives or say first-hand account exist and they speak to why the themes of in African American literature that we find themes of racism, dehumanization, oppression are very rampant because they are predicated on historical facts. But again, it's there a provocation for African American writer? Yes. So for the raw material from or used to write African American literature emanates from the experiences during slavery and their contemporary situation, as we speak at this point. In their words, they try to fight against this sense of nobodiness. They want to make sure that their true identities, their true values are projected in their writing. But at the same time, even within the American, the American literature itself, you find that the black woman has a double pain. Pain of being a black person and also pain of being a black woman. And when it comes to pain of being a woman, she's getting it from the whites and she's also getting it from her black brothers. So that has been one of the major burdens. And writers could not just sit around and fold their arms and watch things for asunder. You must have heard about, you might have heard about the, the Harlem Renaissance. It started from 19, the end of First World War, towards, in, towards the, the 1930s. And of course, you know, it was the rebirth in Harlem 
we deal with social, cultural, and of course, artistic explosion in the black community, which was also known as the New Negro, the New Negro Movement. It is still self-determination and pride in African Americans, though spurring them into a new social awareness and political activism. This was the genesis of that movement. And what was it about? Again, this movement was out to show the exuberance that came with it. And besides that, it was to lay the foundation for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 1960s. And therefore give a new sense of meaningfulness in the lives of black people. The civil rights movements of the 1950s and 60s, the civil rights movements was a struggle for social justice that took place mainly during the 1950s and 1960s. Of course, you, you are aware of Martin Luther King, who was murdered. And you are also aware of the civil war to abolish slaves. And even in the 20th century, as we speak, and 21st century, what are we facing? We are still facing similar situations. So uh, many mobilized during the civil rights movements to give a new definition of who a black person is. And among those people were also writers who started writing right back before even the civil rights movements. And remember, as I said earlier, literature is a tool for social change. And that literature has been very useful in trying to showcase not just the beauty, but the value of black people. And this is not new. If you've studied British Romantic literature, the slogans of the British Romantic literature were liberty, equality, and fraternity. These things were obtained and used as the springboard for Western democracy. I know many of my listeners are from India. You may be aware of your own constitution in India, where it talks about the, the, the downtrodden in India, like the caste system, the integration. It's almost something similar to that, where you have the caste system where the Brahmins are on the top and the Dalits are the untouchable, the downtrodden. Things have changed. They may not be where they should be, but a similar thing for Africans, those here who are Africans, you are aware of the dilemma, the struggles to free yourself from colonialism and to fight against imperialism. So the struggle is everywhere evident. And after the 1960s, or rather during the, uh, the civil rights movement, there was a movement called the Black Earth Movement, 1965 to 1975. The Black Earth Movement was also a group of politically motivated black poets, artists, musicians, such as Nikki Giovanni in her lyrics, where she actually talks about having a home without toilets, suffering, poverty, hardship. But she says the pain was not about poverty. The pain was the pain of slavery. And her interest was fighting to make sure that her family remains in the ambit of love, compassion, Say for love was priceless to her in that lyric. Some there are a number of poets. For example, see some of the select select poet like Langston Hughes. You, you might have read theme for English B. The poem starts with a 22-year-old student striving to meet the expectation of his white professor as it deals with creativity identity crisis. So in this talk, in this poem, you find this 22-year speaker facing the challenge of identity, who am I, and, and racism. He says, I'm black and all that. Right from the beginning, the black speaker struggles to come up to expectation of his white professor. He measures his own success on the basis of a white professor, not on, his, on the basis of his own values, but on the basis of his own, val, uh, on, of his own professor. For example, even as he goes to class, you find that he climbs the stairs that is social open mobility that he is to, symbolically, it is social, social open mobility that he is climbing to meet his counterpart. Except I'm 22, color born in, in, in Winston Salem. I went to school there, the dawn, then here to this college, on here above Harlem. I'm the only color student in my class where I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. In all, he's saying that I, I'm just human. 
He said, I guess you learn from me. Although you are older and white and somewhat more free, somewhat more free. This is the voice of a young 22 year old struggling to meet expectations in a culture that doesn't accept his own values or accept him as full flesh human being. And even similarly, this next poem is Let America Be America Again. The black speaker in this poem focuses on the challenges of attaining the American dream and the hurdles blacks face in reading or in reaching equality, freedom, and attending happiness. To the speaker, such idea has disappeared or never was, but may still be possible. There's a sense of hope. But America is not yet great for, he, for this speaker. It has never been great. Maybe one day America will be great again. And similarly, not for me, I too sing America. It touches on Christ of identity and white dominant culture. Mayor Angelo, still rise. It gives hope. The poem empowers and gives hope to the downtrodden who fight to overcome racism, injustice, victims of stereotype. He says there's new hope. You can rise again. You can rise again. You can attain your American dream. And the except here says, you may, you may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may treat me in the very dirt, but still like dust, I will rise. Still like dust, I will rise. And by implication, there's a biblical reference here with light, in light of the rise of Christ, who was buried and he rose from death. The cross does not destroy him. Therefore, racism, distortion, lies will not take away the dignity of black people. That should be her stance. Richard Rice, black boy, of course, focuses on the degradation racism inflicts on everyone. And Alice Walker, The Tale Life of Grunge Copeland, is another interesting writer, as I mentioned earlier. In this particular novel, you find that Mr. Grace Copeland has been working as a sharecropper for years and he has had big dreams. His dreams were to be an outstanding successful man. But because of the frustration imposed on him, the pain imposed on him by his own white master, he loses hope. He becomes a drunk. He gets married to Margaret and he gets their son Brownfee. And what happens? Because of that frustration, he cheats. He sleeps with a, a prostitute. Therefore, you see moral decadence. And in retaliation, Margaret turns and sleeps not with one person, but with many white people and, and ends up with a light skin child. So one thing that we notice here is that even in this case, Grant Copeland seems to have a stronger moral problem because she left just with a prostitute. And again, unfortunately, Margaret is presented as someone who is sexually promiscuous, it doesn't just be one person, but with many people. And at the end, one important thing that Alice Walker does is that she is able to create mum. Mum in a French word saying la mum shows the same. And mum is married to Brownfield and goes through the same pain Margaret has gone through. Brownfield ends up killing mum. And there's murder, there's killing, there's violence. And similarly, if you look at a short story, come look at the short story, look at everyday use by Alice Walker. And see, Mama, Mama has all the masculine qualities. They say she can slaughter a pig. And that reinforces for some reason the stereotypes about blacks. Very violent, very wild, very strong. The masculine quality associated with women is something that we also notice here. And Maggie, even though she's not very beautiful because beautiful in quotation marks because she had been burned because of as a result of a house fire. But one thing we also notice is that she may physically not be as attractive in quotation marks as people want, but her the, the content of her character gives her beauty. Her, her sister, D, may be very beautiful, but doesn't carry the value that Maggie carries. And as I said, it was going to be a snapshot. I was told that I will do this for just about 40 minutes or so. So Black Lives, one thing we also noticed today is that Black Lives Matter has become a new movement here in the US. It started in July 
13, 2013 to present. And Black Lives Matter is a social movement created by three people. And the goal is to fight against violence and systemic racism towards black people in the US. And if you look at all these movements, and I can promise you that the next generation of writers are going to use the movements now for their literary works. And as we speak, America is on fire because of the murder of George Floyd. And some of the pictures and the images I will show to you may be a bit disheartening, but permit me just to share this with you. This was happening just these few days in America. And from this, you should understand why. African-American literature cannot just be seen as literature that defines the beauty of blackness, the priceless value of black people, but can also be perceived as literature of protest, protesting against racism, protesting against the dehumanization of black women, black men, etc. Current action that would drive bitterness protests in African-American literature. This happened just a few days ago, one week ago. Look at this white police officer who arrested a black man just on suspicion and he kneels for about nine minutes on his neck. He begs, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please give me water. Don't kill me. And he ends up kneeling on his neck until he died. This happened just a week ago. That is the, the police officer kneeling. Tell me why. African-American literature will not be full of bitterness or complaints about racism. And what is the outcome of this action? Black Lives Movement, which of course comprises both white and blacks, whites who are open to change, has provoked or unleashed violence in the US as we speak. People were fighting last night as I talked to you. Look at some of the images. Look at Atlanta, just May 29. Look at the flames. This America is burning. Those are the flames. Look. What happened? Look at the police car on fire. People have gone to war with law enforcement officers and with institutions. Look at fire all over the place. See the conflict between blacks and whites that are fighting each other. Thank you for listening and I'll go now to I'll open this for discussion, comments or questions. So, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Eugene Engagement, sir, for your very informative and enlightening session. There is a huge response from the participants from all over the India and we all feel elevated more informed uh, uh, because of your work and sir many part participants they have queries or they want to ask you something so yes. may i read you some question one by one i request you to answer them one by one uh, the first question is how Sir, how do white people feel about black people? Can I repeat the question? Yeah, please yeah. repeat the question. It's not, yeah, it's yeah. not quite clear, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. How do white people feel about black people in USA after the murder of George Floyd? Oh, yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, we cannot blame all whites. Majority of whites are very upset about it. And that's why if you look at the demonstrations, you'll find that some whites are joining blacks to protest against the murder of George Floyd. 
And you recall that even during the civil rights movements, many whites died alongside blacks fighting for justice. Unfortunately, there are few whites, especially those who claim to be of the superior race, we call them the white supremacists. They see why they see blacks are dots in the zero of nothingness. They think that blacks are not worthy as they are. Yes, given this current situation, many whites are against what happened, the inhuman treatment. But again, you have a minority, a small group of people who don't value blacks as much as the value whites. Uh, my second question, sir. Uh, what is the position of black women writer in 21st century? Yes, the, the position of the black women in the 21st century continues to be to showcase the beauty of black people. They continue to show that black beauty must not be defined on the basis of the white perception. They continue to believe that the paintings, the drawings that have disfigured black women will not continue to stand. Black female writers such as um, Alice Walker continue to write positively about the black image. They continue to showcase black values. Uh, third question is, gender stereotypes exist in almost every patriarchy. Can that stereotype image of women can be changed through literature? Can, 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 um, uh, it's not very clear. Can I ask the question again? The line is breaking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gender stereotypes exist in almost every patriarch patriarchal society. Can that stereotype image of women can be changed through literature? Can you ask the line? I'm sorry, it's not your line is breaking for me. I don't know. Let me see. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Ask, ask the question. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll, mm, okay, I'll, I'll read next question rather. Okay, could you please differentiate gender bias in African American literature? Could, can you, you, could you do? Can you please differentiate gender bias in Afro American literature? Gender bias. Yes. Yes, there's, 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 there's gender bias in Afro-American literature. There's gender bias. Uh, I, I mentioned, I, I mentioned uh, the case, unfortunate, of uh, Alice Walker. Even though she's a female herself, uh, many people will view the way uh, Margaret is presenting her work as being unfair because, for instance, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Mr. Grant Copeland is the first to cheat to sleep with a prostitute. In retaliation, she's presented instead as a woman who is very promiscuous because she ends up sleeping just one person with many people. You see that type of situation. Even in Alice Walker's uh, everyday use, although she points to the values of Africans or Blacks, one thing we also notice in her short story, everyday use is that Mama is giving masculine qualities instead of feminine qualities. And if you go again to the works of, let's say, August Wilson, they say this, this, his play called Fences, published in 1986. In that play, you also see that there's that gender bias. There's that gender bias as well. Thank you. The next question is, what are the chief features of Afro-American feminism that differ the other feminist criticism and theory? I didn't quite get that question, sorry. What are the chief features of Afro-American feminism mm -hmm. that, that differ the other feminism criticism and theories? Okay, yeah. Uh, the, 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 the point, for example, the, the the chief, the chief preoccupation of uh, such feminists, uh, African American feminists, or feminism, or in the U.S., is very, is unique in its, in the sense that, for instance, 
they continue, as I mentioned, I've shown a few slides to you, the concept of distortion, the concept of distortion, they continue to showcase that as unacceptable. They continue to argue that the features of a black woman should not be used to distort the value of a black person. They continue to show that irrespective of what other feminist writers across the world go through, the black person is in a unique position. The black woman is in a unique position in the US because she goes through the torment of a white person. For example, look at the streetcar named Desire. In the streetcar named Desire play, the only female character is a Negro woman, and she's presented with these outward qualities as well. So yes, generally speaking, the whole concept of gender, of feminism, is the same. It has its different uh, peculiarity. It has a peculiarity dependent on where you find yourself. American writers are facing the realities of racism, but if you go to, say, African writers who are also feminists, their issue is not about racism. It's not about racism. So there are those differences. They have commoner things, but there's a distinction, yes. Uh, the next question is, African society was matriarchal before the whites colonized the country, and women were the head of the family. Do you think that it is possible to change the patriarchal stereotypes? But, uh, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> Africa remains a patriarchal society. And I'll not just say Africa, but even India. India too is a very patriarchal society. Uh, for example, if you go to India, you find that the men are very, I don't want to use the word controlling, they're in charge of things. Uh, I was talking to my, my wife who teaches in high school and she was given some high value to the discipline of, uh, especially those from India. When they come for parent conferences, you see the man is ahead, the mother is next, the first son, they line up and they come in order. So that, 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 that patriarchal system is very, is, is, is very prevalent in Africa. And I really wonder whether I can easily change. But the good thing is that women have gained more rights. In Africa, for example, including Cameroon, you have women who are have top ranks in the military. You have women who are presidents of universities. You have a female president. You have a female president in Liberia some time ago and all this. So you see that women are taking power. But also remember that this also stems from the Bible. God created Adam and Eve, and Adam was supposed to be the head to lead the way. And it's also continued because they say the woman was created from the left rib of a man. I think I wonder the patriarchal system will continue to be there for quite some time. And let me also add that, for example, take the case of India, because many of my, I've done thousands of people, about 2,000 people, I know we have about almost 2,800 here now, or 2,700 people who registered. Take the case of India. In the past, if a man were to die, let's say you, 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 you die of an accident, what will happen with that? You'll be, crimin you, you, you'll be burned to death alongside the, death, the, the, the corpse of your husband. It shows that sense of belonging. You, the man owned you. It is no longer the case, but this is a fact. It may not be pleasant to hear. Every society is, has its own way. In Africa, the men are domineering. In the American culture too, it's the same thing. So the patriarchal system is in place and it will be very, very difficult to alter it. But uh, women are having more rights and I hope it changes. But also remember that many women in the American culture are like heads of their household. They are economically strong and etc. Maybe I took quite some long time to answer this quite interesting question. Sorry, go ahead. Um, another very interesting question, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Nwana Omenuku. The first Igbo novel shows that initial slave trails began with the Africans selling their own people amongst themselves. How much do you think this has created an impact on the burden of race, gender in African American literature? That's so true. And I will confess that while teaching in, in the university, 
such topics came up. And one of my students said, your people saw us. It is true, unfortunately, that some very bad Africans saw their own brothers and sisters in a giveaway price. No price is good enough to buy a human being by the you could get a, a, a bottle of liquor, maybe a bottle of whiskey. The king would say, just go to the village, catch as many as you want. Tobacco, gunpowder. Yes, they were so that way. And this has had a tremendous impact. Africans who did this cannot be exempted from the plight, the burdens that the current American system has. They cannot be exempted. And has impacted in the sense that notwithstanding the, the selling and all that inhuman treatment, you find that many black writers, many African-American writers are trying, trying to write back. They are still trying to elevate their values. And their argument is that every society has its own bad elements. In the U.S., we have the KKK. They are of the white race. Not every white person is bad. So we cannot use a few to judge. The majority. In any case, in African American literature, the good thing is that they are out not to fight against Africans who saw them. They are out to yoke hands, to go shoulder to shoulder with them and elevate the value, the pricey nature of a black person, the pricey nature of a black woman, etc. Uh, the next question is. Could you tell? Could you tell some incidents on double discrimination of African American living in Western countries? Could I tell you what? Uh, could you tell some incidents on double discrimination of African women living in Western countries? Double discrimination. Yes, uh, 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 living in other countries uh, again. As I mentioned earlier, the black woman has two major crises. The crisis of being a woman, because many view women as not worth enough as men. Uh, to the point that there are more li liabilities in certain families. In Asia, including some parts of India, you must have realized that having many girl children will so also imply that you need to pay a huge dowry, not all over India, but I, there are people who take loans just to marry off their daughters. And the men are asking for so much. I need a flat screen TV, I need for a good iPad and all these. So it's very costly to the point that it's become a major issue. But in essence, the black women have double crisis. The crisis of being a woman, minimized by all, but also the crisis of being a black person. And it is even worse for a black immigrant, like my wife, Dr. Gladys Ngezim. She faces the challenges of being a woman. She faces the challenges of being an international and she faces the challenges of being black. Uh, the next question is, what is the current status of black women in America? What kind of awareness can be given to eradicate the racism tendency? Right. The current status of black women in America is, is, uh, is sad. For example, in, in black communities, only 75% of black women are not married. 75%. In the white community, only 29% are not married. Also, the black women are seen as white, they are seen as violent, they are seen as aggressive. And unfortunately, many have taken those stereotypes and repeated them against them. And the good thing that's happening is that black women are becoming major stakeholders in American political system. Look at the current political system. Look at those running for offices. Look at the senators. Look at the Congress people. Look at the writers. 
And I can confess too, that as I teach in college, in my class, I kind of have a class of about 20 students, 25 students. You have like five black, black males, and majority will be black women. So black women are rising, are in upward mobility, socially, politically, and economically. Therefore, things are changing. Things are changing in America. And there's high possibility that the vice presidential candidate for 2020 election, who will go after Mr. Trump, will likely be a black woman or a minority. So these stereotypes will continue to change. Michelle Obama as the first lady, black lady, to be the first leader of America has also given hope to many blacks in this country. Therefore, the situation is improving, not as good as it should be, but they need to continue to educate themselves, to, to, to be entrepreneurs, to create businesses, to create awareness, to be proud of their own identity so that they don't start going trying to bleach their colors, to have light skin color, to impress or to call P the white. After all, in literature, when something is black, they say it stands for evil. When it's white, they say it stands for pure. Those are the jargons. Those are useless concepts imposed on us in, during the, the, the days of slavery and perpetuated during colonialism. Uh, sir, again, very interesting question related to your explanation. Whether African American can change the narrative of racial discrimination in US or it will just be a cosmetic display of equality. I'm sorry, I, I yeah, should yeah, just I, say I, one more thing. Yeah, yeah, yes. I, I repeat. Whether African American can change the narrative of racism, racial discrimination in US, or it will just be a cosmetic display of equality. That's true. That's again, it goes back to what they can. They can do it. They can change such stereotypes and are doing so. Take the case of the, the House of Congress. Many black women are there. Many African Americans are there. Take the Senate. You have black, a black woman as a senator. You have, of course, a black male as a senator too. Take our governors of different states. They just strive towards that. But in essence, as I mentioned earlier, they are in social, political, and economic urban mobility. And I don't think it's going to be cosmetic. Look at those who are leading Black Lives movements. The leaders of Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, are ladies. They are eloquent, they are strong. I show you images of women fighting with police officers. That is an example, a demonstration of their passion to change. I don't expect that it will just be cosmetic. I expect that will change. But the point is that they are not just on the street. They are in the classroom. They are at the banks. They are in the industries. They are in the world of technology. So they are all over the place. They are writing books, as I mentioned. Uh, next question is, could you please explain the gender biasness at working place and at the home, as far as African American women are concerned. Say one more time, sir, please. Uh, explain gender biasness at working place and at home, as far as African American women are concerned. Yes, that's true. It goes back. Let's take the case. Let's start with uh, the home. The gender biases at home, especially among the lower class blacks. Gender biases from their male counterparts, where a number of men tend to abuse their own wives, they abuse their girlfriends, uh, they get people pregnant and disappear. That happens because they see them as breeders, they see them as just good for childbearing. A number of them do that, especially at the lower rung of society. Also, the lower classes do that at home. And even in the upper classes, the woman doesn't have an equal voice. But one thing happening for women at home is that many of them sustain their homes. They are flag barriers. The livelihoods of the family depend on them. They are the breadwinners of their homes. 
unfortunately, that has also created tension. Has also created tension between the black man and the woman at home. Because the black woman is more economically empowered, more like the black man, and that has created some problems. I am a man. I'm supposed to be superior. Don't tell me what to do and things like that. This is happening at home. And if you take, for example, go to Alice Walker, the, uh, the tail level of Grand Scotland, you find a similar situation where mum, mum is educated and beautiful. But brown fee, instead of cherishing these values, is very upset and angry about her accomplishment to the point that he murders her. At workplace, you find a similar situation where the black women are often discriminated, especially with respect, not just because they are facing that double problem, they are black and they are also women. And at the workplace, they don't have the same possibilities as many, 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 many men do. And that is why you see President Obama passing the legislation on the Equal Pay Act and things like that, just to make sure when black women go to the workplaces, they too should earn as much as the men working at the same level with them. Uh, that is a comparative question. How the gender and race burden in African American literature differs from other countries and cultures? Okay, race. On, let me take gender and race burden. As I mentioned earlier, African writers are not so are not writing about racism. They are writing about racism. They are writing about other preoccupations, especially the post-colonial writer, try to redefine the values of the colon those the colonized. But the gender and burden situation of uh, in African American literature and in, in African American culture is different in the sense that every other thing they complain and write about stems from racism. So they are crushing under the weight of racism. The gender bias in the US carries the flavor of racism, which is not necessarily so in other countries. I'm aware that in other cultures, there's that discrimination, but it's not necessarily about racism. And the right word for this will be ethnicity. There is ethnicity, not even racism, because we are all one big human race. So it's more about ethnicity and not just that. You go to Europe, there's discrimination, Germany, Britain, all those places have discrimination. And I keep making reference even to India. You see how that there's some dichotomy between the light skinned Indians and the, the dark skinned Indians. And these are all colonial mentalities that were imposed because India was colonized too by Britain. Take, for example, take the, I went to Mumbai and I visited the gateway of India. Dr. Avinas may be aware of this. I went to the Elephantas, five caves that have been there for 5,000 years, and a whole structure was put in place just for Judge Five to visit India. You be such a big monument just for some leader to come and visit a country. And they were not building some monuments for their own heroes, like Mohammed Gandhi and others. They were paying attention more to this superior person coming to civilize the so-called uncivilized. But then, again, the preoccupation is different. Thank you. Uh, do you think that the verbal attack on Meghan Markle by the white media is a ripple of racism? The attack on who? Meghan Markle. Do you think that the verbal attack on Meghan Markle by white people is a ripple of racism? I'm um, uh, just to be frank with you, I'm not very familiar with that. I'm not very familiar just because intellectualism, this with honesty, I'm not very familiar with that. But I will not be surprised if it is that way. I will not be surprised. I have not paid close attention to that, so I can't, I can't address it. I don't know the detail because I don't want to give the wrong impression. Things that I don't know, I tell you I don't know. Because intellectualism deal with honesty as well. It is a very broad fee and there may be things left and right. It could be, I'm not sure. Oh. 
can you please throw some light towards how the position of black women have changed since ages ages and how they have managed to stand for themselves in a patriarchal world thank you and the position of black women for ages for example i mentioned to you the the situation of sarah badman sarah badman was that woman who was enslaved and showcased to be sexually inferior and all those things and you also should be aware that i mentioned about auction blocks where black slaves female slaves were auctioned as objects so were objectified and auctioned and throughout history you find that the black women were abused they were raped by their slave masters they were domestic slaves and all those type of things but after emancipation their status have been changing there has been an over mobility because if you rape a black woman today you go to jail if you beat a black woman you go to jail so because of social rights the situation of the black woman has changed again at the social level where they are engaged in social activities they are church leaders they are examples of moral propriety at the economic level the entrepreneurs the bankers at the political level they are in the front lines of politics so there has been a steady upward mobility in terms of the status of the black woman so there's been some change and i think is more is going to continue no one imagine that in 2020 anybody will be thinking that of the possibility of having a black woman as the vice presidential candidate so there's that Yes. Uh, there are so many questions, sir, but because of uh, time constraints, we cannot extend the session. So, your uh, note or your views were very enlightening, very informative. So, now uh, the time has come to move towards the concluding part of the session. Now, may I request Dr. Grishma Khobra Gade, sir, to take over the uh, session. Over to you, sir. Khobra Gade, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Samazdar, sir. thank you samajdar sir uh, good evening dear part good evening dear participants i hope you remember me i am dr grishma khobra gade assistant professor department of english bk birla college kalyan maharashtra i presume from your comments that you had excellent meaningful and useful session as put it rightly gratitude is a quality similar to electricity it must be produced and discharged and used in order to exist so here i am to propose the vote of thanks on behalf of department of english bk birla college i extend my thanks to our eminent speaker dr eugene professor department of english clayton state university georgia usa we are indeed fortunate to have eugene sir with us thanks for being the part of the bk birla family and being the resource person for this webinar i am sure participant will agree with me if i say you enthralled us sir with your language with your social consciousness and with with your presentation thank you professor eugene sir now i express my deep sense of gratitude to our honorable principal dr avinash patil sir and our mentor dr naresh chandra director bk birla college for always motivating us to conduct such type of seminar webinars we thank you sir for your constant support and guidance i would like to thank dr sangeeta sharma madam head department of english bk birla college for taking wonderful initiatives being the pillar of this webinar and meticulously planning and organizing this event i also thanks my dedicated my other colleagues dedicated and responsible colleagues professor vinod rajput sir head department of computer science mr kiran raiker librarian central library bk birla college professor asmita gupta vice principal it department for handling all technical issues without you we would have not achieved success thank you all technical team of it last but not the least i thank all of you 
the enthusiastic participants for being a part of this such a great grand webinar. I wish you all the best for your future. Thank you once again on behalf of BK Birla College, Autonomous Kalyan, Maharashtra, India. Stay happy, stay home, stay safe. Jai Hind, Jai Maharashtra. Over Thank to you. Madam. It was a wonderful session, Professor Eugene and Gazim. Very insightful and many of the queries you tried to satisfy very well. And now in the end, I would just like to make an important announcement that the feedback link is posted in the chat box. Dear participants, the link is going to remain active only till 9 p.m. Those who submit their feedback by 9 p.m. will get e-certificates within a week's time. So please fill the feedback form. I thank you all for registering for this webinar. A big thanks to Professor Eugene Engesim, my colleagues, the chairman of the institution who has a great vision for the growth of the college and because the college is working and uh, working under his wings, it is progressing from strength to strength. I thank the chairman of the college, Sri O.R. Chitlangi ji. Sir, thanks a lot for motivating us with your strong words. Thank you so much. Bye bye. संगीता मैम